Hello, and welcome to the Spinal Cord Injury Forum. My name is Heather Barnett. I'm a spinal cord injury physician in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine and director of the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury System here at the University of Washington. Uh, tonight, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Carrie Keyes. Dr. Keyes is a board-certified plastic surgeon and a UW Associate Professor of Plastic Surgery. Dr. Keyes will be presenting on pressure sores and flap surgery. Welcome, Dr. Keyes. Um, all right, like she said, I work uh, half-time at Harborview uh, as a plastic surgeon and half-time at the VA. Um, my best friend from my childhood is a T11 paraplegic from, uh, she had transverse myelitis when we were uh, 17. So uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, and uh, during, as a warning, as a, during the talk today, I, as a surgeon, I do a lot of very visual things. And there are some photographs that are of actual human tissue. Um, I'll try and give a little bit of a warning, but um, as we're talking about pressure sores, I think it's really important that people with spinal cord injuries or people taking care of those with spinal cord injuries know what to look for with pressure sores um, and to know what it looks like when something's going wrong. Um, so I did include some photographs just uh, to be aware of. So the things that we're gonna talk about, um, we're gonna talk about how pressure sores happen we're gonna talk about how to evaluate how bad a pressure sore is, what the evaluation encompasses for a pressure sore, the medical evaluation, what to expect during the recovery from flap surgery, which is what we call the pressure sore reconstruction, what is flap surgery, and then uh, what to do about bone infections uh, and what you can do uh, as uh, the the non-surgeon. Um, I'll talk about my part, but I'm gonna talk about your part as well. All right, we're gonna talk just a little bit about pressure sores themselves. Um, the physiology of pressure sores happens when the pressure on the tissue exceeds the blood supply inside the tissue. And so this graph shows you the arterial size decreasing as you come down to the capillaries, and the capillaries are that little strip of gray in the middle, and then the veins get bigger from there. So that little strip in the middle is where our risk is. That's the, the perfusion of oxygen to your tissues. And so you can see in the, the millimeters of mercury are the vertical column there. And so we're really looking around 30 millimeters of mercury is the blood pressure inside your tissues. So we talk about blood pressure like being 100 over something or 120 over something, but that's in our big arteries. And so in the small tissue, the blood supply to the actual tissue, it's only about 30 millimeters of mercury, which is really not very much. And so that pressure causes tissue death when, we, uh, when you have that level of pressure on the tissues. So, Sitting, this is a, a, a sit, seating map, uh, just a person sitting on a mat that measures the millimeters of mercury. And you can see that uh, the one on the on closer to me here is with the feet that are too high on the footrest. And so the, the pressure is pushed back onto the sit bones or the ischium. And that generates up to 100 millimeters of mercury on right over the ischium compared to the around 60 millimeters of mercury when the cushion is well balanced. But even with a well balanced cushion on that left sided image, we're still exceeding what our capillary pressure is. So we have to do pressure releases when we're in a seated position because otherwise there's no perfusion to the tissue. This is a similar map of laying down. Um, uh, in a supine or uh, yeah, a supine position. And so you can see that similar 60 degree or 60 millimeter of mercury pressure over the sacrum. And it makes sense then why these are where our pressure sores happen. These are our bony prominences. Um, and there are some adjustments for how heavy you are and what your, how uh, thick your soft tissues are and how prominent your bones are. But this gives you a really general sense of how those pressure injuries are happening. So that's that graph we were talking about. Okay, 
So how pressure sores develop? Um, pressure itself, like we just talked about, in excess of your capillary perfusion. And generally, two, exceeding that capillary perfusion for two hours causes irreversible damage. So that gives us information about how, uh, how frequently we need to turn or lift or pressure relief in order to prevent a pressure injury. Um, and higher pressures for less time will cause the same amount of necrosis. Uh, or lower pressures for longer time. Um, friction is the second factor that comes into tissue injury. So it's not all just pressure. Friction is the resistance of two materials moving against each other. And so this is skin and whatever the skin is touching. Skin and bedding, skin and clothing, skin and your seat cushion. Uh, and that friction uh, causes abrasions or tears to the skin which then results in a loss of the integrity of the skin. And then there's moisture that leaks from that, the broken skin. And that increases the friction between the two surfaces. They stick together more. And then you get another skin tear, and, the, and it's just a cycle. So keeping friction down is very important. And with friction comes shear. So they kind of go hand in hand. We th I think about shear as being an internal injury. So shear is the stress inside the tissues. So if your skin sticks to your cushion and you move the, the muscles and the bones underneath, you can tear the tissues inside and that's a shear injury, stretch or angulation or injury of the blood vessels inside direct stress on the tissues. So we want to minimize the skin sticking to the environment as well. And that can happen with moisture, right? Moisture makes our tissues stick. So keeping things dry is really important. So moisture increases friction, maceration of the tissues or that constant wetness reduces our skin integrity. Uh, and then you get, you know, moisture dermatitis. This is just a, essentially a picture of what happens with chronic moisture in the area with that skin breaking down. And so the most common sources of moisture besides friction injury or like essentially the loss of skin barrier is urine or feces that are leaking uh, for any variety of reasons that cause maceration of the tissues and then tissue breakdown. All right, so pressure sores this is a study that's quite old, it's from the 60s, but this in my practice, I've been doing this now for 16 years, and this is pretty, holds still pretty true to my practice, um, that the ones that I see most frequently are essentially mostly ischium, and then kind of evenly distributed between the sacrum and the trochanter, depending on sort of the activity level. And when we talk about a more elderly debilitated, we talk about more sacral wounds, when we talk about more active, we talk about more ischial wounds. Um, but ischium is the sit bones, trochanter is the hip bones, and sacrum is the tailbone area, um, when we talk about it kind of in lay terms. All right. Um, there's a whole committee that spent weeks and months, uh, they probably get together every year uh, and come up with exactly how to define the stages of pressure sores. And so um, it's not terribly complex. Uh, if you have non-blanching redness, so you poke it and it doesn't turn white, uh, that's a stage one pressure sore. If the skin breaks open, uh, that's stage two. So you essentially have a blister, uh, a popped blister, or something that looks like an abrasion that's in, in partial thickness into the skin. And once we get full thickness into the fat layer, that's a stage three. This is a granulated stage three wound. So there's a, a, a relatively short phase between having an unstageable wound, which is where you have an eschar or necrotic tissue that is still stuck inside the wound and that necrotic tissue being gone and it granulating. So we don't usually see a wound where you're just looking directly at fat because it usually by the time the dead tissue is out, it, your body has started to generate some healing tissue. So it looks like this, that's why it looks red because the fat has developed some healing tissue that's called granulation on it. And the last stage is a stage four 
Um, this is where a pressure sore, a pressure injury has gone all the way down to the level of the muscle or the bone. Uh, and um, in some areas like uh, over the ischium, there really isn't much muscle in that area. It's mostly bony in that area. So it really depends on where we're at. But once we're at that deep level, that's a stage four injury. Um, and then anything where you can't tell yet is just considered an unstageable injury until you have that tissue, out, the dead tissue out of the way. Um, okay, so we'll talk about healing of pressure sores. Um, if you uh, essentially are trying to avoid surgery, uh, then healing conservatively is possible in, in most circumstances, given enough time. And I think that's really where the decision point comes is how much time. Um, this uh, wound that you see here, this is over a uh, 14 to 16 week, 16 week period, 20 week period. So that's months, right, of pressure offloading and wound care. Um, and for most people, pressure offloading means in bed. So giving up your daily activities um, and that's hard to do. Uh, but as we're gonna talk about in surgery, surgery is not magic and it doesn't, it's not like, well, we could just go do the surgery and then get on with things. It's not that simple. And so in most cases, if you can heal a pressure sore conservatively, that's what you should do. Um, because w we'll talk about with the surgery, there's really a limited amount of tissue that we're gonna be able to work with in order to fix something surgically. So if your body can build the tissue on its own, that's really the path that's most appropriate but it takes a lot of time and there's no magical fast forward button. So we'll spend the rest of this talking about flap surgery, um, which we actually shouldn't consider as flap surgery. We should consider it as a flap program. And that's because it really involves the surgery itself is the easy part. And we'll talk about the surgery, but the lead up to surgery, the preparatory, uh, evaluation and um, elements that we're gonna take care of before surgery are more important than the technique of the surgery itself. Um, and then the recovery, I think, is the hard part. And I can't do that as the surgeon. That's, only, that's on the patient, but it is boring and it's long and it's frustrating because the, it's very common for there to be a complication after surgery, a wound healing complication after surgery that increases that amount of t that time, that demand on the recovery. So we're gonna talk about the whole program of a flat program. I have a flat program both at Harborview and at the VA. They're both very similar. Um, and that's because there's just elements like building blocks that we put together um, based on the evidence that research has built over time about what works, what's important and how to minimize the complications so there's a pre-operative period um, that's a evaluation and interventions ahead of surgery. And then the surgery itself, which is for me the fun part um, and also relatively easy part. And then the post-operative bed rest and remobilization protocols. So before surgery, um, whether it's done in one clinic or across multiple visits, one needs to see a rehab medicine physician. And that's particularly for the elements of bowel and bladder, which we've talked about before, uh, about why, which is because that urine and stool on the skin is toxic to the skin's integrity. And so that is gonna result in the risk of pressure injury happening again, or healing complications on the stitch line after surgery. So bladder leakage needs to be managed. And sometimes that needs to be uh, with Botox and sometimes it needs to be a suprapubic tube. Uh, so there are, are, it's not one solution for every problem and we're not gonna get into all the solutions for bladder leakage at this talk, but that's the, the range of problems that we deal with there. So once the bladder leakage is addressed, then the next element is about bowel. What I really wanna see is somebody who has a regular bowel regimen that has been working for them over time. And that means formed stool on a regular schedule through whatever method it takes. So that usually is some combination of stool softeners, and digital stimulation, whatever it is that is a, a functioning bowel regimen. And that what we don't wanna see is someone who's having frequent stool leakage that's unintended. So uh, essentially surprise 
find uh, that's more than, you know, once a month is probably about an, an acceptable level of having stool leakage. But beyond that, we the it's devastating to have chronic diarrhea or loose stool um, in the area because that really is terribly toxic to the skin. And so some surgeons historically, and even some of my colleagues that work at other facilities require a colostomy for patients undergoing flap surgery. And I don't think in my practice, I don't require a colostomy if you're having surgery. It's only a colostomy if it's needed to keep the stool off your skin. And so there's only select circumstances and it's probably for my patients less than 10% that come to me for a flap evaluation. We decide that we need to do surgery. It's a, if this is a pressure sore that needs surgery and that this person needs a colostomy before we can do that. Um, so the majority of people don't need a colostomy because with our rehab team, we can get a functioning bowel program working. That being said, most of my patients who get colostomies are actually like, wow, this is way easier than not having a colostomy. So I don't want it reversed. I actually find it a lot easier to do my bowel program with it on the front of me where I can reach it and manage it. Um, but that's individual for each patient. All right. Um, so other elements that our rehab physicians are going to help us manage preoperatively, spasticity, particularly hip flexor spasticity. So there's lots of different types of spasticity that can be problematic, but in the hip flexors specifically, that jumpiness or pulling of the legs will actually stretch where the stitches are on the backside and can pop those stitches open in the postoperative period. So spasticity needs to be evaluated and optimized before somebody can go to surgery because we don't want the surgery getting undone by jerking of the legs. And then evaluation of pressure relief practices. So making sure somebody understands from their initial rehab instruction still how to do those pressure relief and skin checks, skin safety, uh, and is really engaged in preventing pressure sores in the future. And so sometimes we need to do an education period or sort of an assessment of how engaged somebody is in their skin protection before we go through with fixing it so that it doesn't just happen again. All right, and then my job uh, in that pre-surgery evaluation is evaluating the wound itself, which, and, and what I care most about more than what size is it and where is it, because kind of no matter where it is and what size it is, I can figure out how to fix it. But what I care about is what caused it, how long has it been there, what's it doing? Um, and that's because if it was caught, if, it, if the answer is, I don't really know what caused it, and I don't really know what caused the last one, it means there's some element that is not resolved in prevention of pressure injury. The ones that are easiest are, it, I had a bad transfer, or I took a long plane flight and I found out my cushion was deflated by the end of it, and I didn't know, I had a cushion deflation event. So some specific injury event because that is usually somebody who's otherwise been very attentive to their skin integrity. And so I need to know how it happened. And then I want to know what it's doing over time. Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Is it, it was getting better for a time and now we're stalled? That tells me what capacity your body has for healing. Um, because a wound that is failing to make any progress is the surgery won't work. It won't heal because your body's not adding material to that site. If it healed well for a while and has stalled, that's more common. That essentially says my body is, has the capacity to, but I can't do anything else with it. I've done everything I can and now I need surgery. If it's getting worse, that's not the time to do it because that's telling me that there's an infection, there's too much pressure on it, uh, there's uh, like poor nutrition or some other factor that the body is going the wrong direction and we can't do surgery when we're going backwards. All right, and then I need to know the medical history. And, I, and there are lots of things that matter, but what really matters is if you have diabetes, is it controlled? Because poorly controlled diabetes causes healing problems. Do you have adequate nutrition? Or are your tissues so thick that it, there's going to be so much pressure and stretch with your seating that it's going to make the surgery very, very difficult to heal. Thick tissues just don't heal as well. The adipose layer doesn't have as much blood supply. It doesn't hold stitches as well. 
And so the thicker the adipose layer or the fat layer, the more likely it is there's gonna be healing problems. And then I also care about immunosuppression and anticoagulation, which increases the risk for hematomas. So those are the sort of medical history things I'm looking for. I need to know if somebody can lay flat, like all the way flat. And that's a, there's sort of a no exception element to that. If you have back pain that makes it so you can't lay flat, and by flat, I mean with your head at the same height as your hips. It doesn't mean on your back. It can be on your sides. It can be on your stomach. I have some patients who love to lay prone, but it has to be flat in any position. And that means also you have to be able to eat laying flat. And I have quadriplegic patients who cannot eat laying flat, right? Because there's, they don't have a strong cough and they can't clear their airway if they get fluids into it. And those patients preoperatively, anyone who has a question, they say, I don't know if I can eat laying flat. And we decide, is it safe for us to try at home before surgery and see how it goes? Or if you're like, I'm pretty worried about that, or I'm pretty worried about it myself, then we do a supine swallow eval where we actually use the speech therapist, use a, a, an endoscope to watch the swallow function while you're laying down to tell me whether or not it's going down the wrong way because then we do a feeding tube temporarily. And that's a G tube, which is placed through the abdominal wall because it's too long of a time to use the nasal feeding tube. They're uncomfortable in your nasal passage. You can use them for a day or two, but you don't want it for six weeks after surgery while you're in bed, it's very uncomfortable. And so we do a temporary gastrostomy tube. Um, it's just placed percutaneously, usually by our radiologist, and then it's taken out at the end uh, of your recovery period. Um, but that helps prevent um, what can be quite dangerous. I have had a patient who had a cardiac arrest and thankfully did not die, but had cardiac arrest um, from uh, essentially aspiration, trying to eat in a, a recovery flat position. And then nicotine usage, um, there can't be any. So that means including nicotine replacement. So I have to be fully off of nicotine in the preoperative period to prevent healing complications. Okay, um, and then my ancillary uh, adjunct that I use before surgery. Physical therapy is probably my most important colleagues. They do a seating evaluation like those pressure mapping that we saw before. Make sure that the manual or power chair that's being used is well fit and up to date. It's safe to use, that the cushion is well fit. If a new cushion or new uh, equipment needs to be ordered, that's all done before surgery. Transfers are checked, especially if, if you're doing your own transfers, that those are safe transfers that are gonna be okay after surgery to prevent injury, or then our OT colleagues also get involved. Do we need a new padded shower chair? Do we need a padded commode chair? Do we need a lift at home if the transfers are not going well? Do, what equipment do we need in order to protect the skin at home after surgery? So we set up ahead of time for success after. At Harborview, um, we have a social worker who also helps us make sure the patient has a place to go after surgery that is a good situation. They have enough caregiver support or all of the caregiver support that they qualify for. That essentially, if they can access something that they haven't accessed yet, we help them access that. And then any other ancillary services that may be available to them. And then as needed, we also have rehab psychology that helps talk people through this recovery phase because it is a strain. It is boring and hard and lonely, uh, and it often goes wrong in the middle. There's al almost always some sort of little something that's a complication, and it can be uh, it can be hard to go through alone in the hospital. Um, I have nutrition dietitians available to me for people who may have nutritional issues that we could help with ahead of time. Um, and then we talked about when a colostomy might be helpful, when a suprapubic tube might be helpful, and then the radiology, interventional radiology for my gastrostomy tube needs. Okay, so why go through all of this? We need you to protect your soft tissues after surgery or it's all a waste. Um, the recurrence rates, when we look at the, all of the data going back you know, 40, 50 years, it depends on who's reporting their results, but the recurrence rates over time are like 30 to 60%. So let's just say 50% average. So for every two surgeries I do, one of them 
gets a pressure sore in the same spot again at some point in the future. And so we really want to do everything ahead of time that we can to prevent that from happening. Because each time I try and reoperate on a spot that I've already done, it gets less likely that it's gonna work. So the recovery uh, has a very specific prescribed protocol. It is a written out protocol. Um, I have a home version of it now for patients who uh, don't qualify to stay as an inpatient, whether it's for insurance reasons or our hospital at Harborview, unfortunately, sometimes is so full that I can't get a patient in for the six to eight week stay that they need to be there. So I have a home protocol now as well, but it's the same, which is that you are at a head and hips at the same level, whether it's in a either side, stomach, back position for three weeks. We'll say, some people, young, very healthy, could get away with two weeks. Usually it's three. People I'm very worried about, malnourished, very cachectic, like very thin, maybe four weeks. And then we start the remobilization. And the remobilization has a sort of an a early phase, which is a stretching. And I make sure that the hips can get to a seated position uh, without too much tension on the stitches before we actually get into a seat. And so uh, in the hospital, the physical therapist will come by and, and do range of motion. And when you get to 110 degrees, which is a, you know, essentially a little bit more than our 90 degree, 90, our right angle seating because people bend forward a little bit in their chairs. Um, and that's once we're at 110 degrees, then I know that we can move forward with the seating protocol. Um, and about three quarters of the patients take longer than this prescribed six weeks that we have here um, in the hospital. And that's usually for healing problems. All right, so even when I'm doing my very best work and we are doing all of that work ahead of time in the preoperative multidisciplinary evaluation, still three quarters of people are having some complication after surgery that takes longer. So this is why we have rehab psychology involved as well, because it is stressful to have your surgery not work perfectly. I need a rehab psychologist also. Um, so the bed rest phase, that two to four week phase is done in, in the hospital in this mattress, which is an air fluidized bed. It goes by all sorts of brand names. Over time, they keep changing. I try and keep up with them. I think it's currently called Envella. It used to be called a Clinitron for a decade or so. It was called a right height for a while. So you may have heard any of those terms. All of them are air fluidized mattresses, which are tiny, tiny silicone sand, like little tiny, they call them silicone beads. It's about sand texture that air is blown into from underneath and it creates the, almost essentially the texture of a waterbed, uh, but without the water. Uh, the upper half that is blue foam here is uh, that is a foam air cell mattress. Um, and that's where the upper part of the torso goes. But then everything from the hips down is in this uh, waterbed texture. Um, and the flat lying, they have the head of the bed up here, which is not what we want. I think I put a little, little X on that. So the head of the bed has to stay flat. And that's including for hygiene, bowel care, meals, all of it. Um, all right, so around week three, we do that hip stretching to 110 degrees, and then this is the schedule for sitting. So you can see days one through 10 there, which is three times a day, starting 15 minutes, and then the next day is 30 minutes, three times a day, 45 minutes, three times a day. We transfer on to a regular mattress on day three, so we're off of that, that way. If somebody does their own transfers, they can start doing their own manual transfers because uh, you can't really do it out of the air fluidized mattress. You can't, there's no push on a waterbed if you're doing your own transfers. So, uh, and then we start doing showering and bowel self bowel care, like on a commode. If you do the, if that's part of your own regimen on day six, and then we're up to four hours by day ten, and then you get to go home. All right, so some principles of flap surgery. Warning, there are photographs in this. Um, there's just a couple graphic pictures here and this I just really wanna explain the complexity of this so that if you or someone you care about or one of your patients needs flap surgery, you have an actual idea of what that means. Um, and 
the first part of it is cutting away the bad tissue. And I tell patients, it's like if you had like a wormhole or a brown spot in an apple, you have to pare it back to the good part. You want to get rid of the bad. So we, I literally cut away the bad tissue. I paint. That's what that bluish coloration is. I paint the inside of the ulcer cavity. So I make sure I get it all. And then I take the rind out uh, surgically. And you can see how the defect changes removing the rind. So something that looks like a small wound, once you cut the rind away, the rind is often kind of a, it's almost like a balloon. It's like folded up in there, has sometimes a narrow neck, but then a big space underneath that you can't appreciate as well. So how much bigger the wound is after the removal of that tissue. And then I have to reconstruct, that's the defect I actually have to reconstruct, not the, not the wound, but the resultant defect after excising the wound. So this next picture is another example of what it looks like after you excise. That looks like a little pinhole there in the skin, but underneath it tracks up and down the sacrum. And when I remove that tissue that's involved in the wound, the rind, this is what the actual defect looks like. And so what you see before surgery is different than what the problem actually is inside surgery that needs to be fixed. All right, so what about bone infection? Um, bone infection is scary um, to hear about, and um, there's a sense, I think, that some people feel like I have a bone infection and that means I have to have surgery. And that's not necessarily true, and I um, have uh, found throughout my career and the, the research that's been done that the imaging is not perfect. Um, the imaging is sensitive, which means it can pick it up if it's there, but it often overcalls it. So things that look like bone infection may not actually be bacteria in the bone. It may be swelling in the bone or uh, inflammation response in the bone, but not actually in the bacteria itself. So we have a hard time telling for sure that it's truly a bone infection, or maybe it is a bone infection, but your body can actually treat it. So in this three-year study, 50% of people that had diagnosed on imaging osteomyelitis actually ended up needing surgery. And the other half healed over their osteomyelitis, whether it was or wasn't, they healed over it on their own. And so it's more likely that you'll need surgery if you have a bone infection, but it doesn't, it's not an automatic. So the, bacteria, the body does have a harder time getting bacteria out of bone because bone doesn't bleed as well as the rest of our tissues. It just doesn't have as robust of a blood supply. So it, your body can't deliver its natural fighting. It can't deliver antibiotics as easily to that area. Um, and it is dangerous to allow a bone infection to progress deep into the pelvis. That can result in the need for a hip level amputation or a hemipelvectomy. So it's a tough balance to know, should I wait and try and let this bone infection heal? Or do I need to do something about it right away so that I don't end up losing my leg? And that can be uh, a scary uncertainty, but I don't have, there is no right answer um, because you don't want a surgery that you don't need, uh, but you also don't want to get sick. So, uh, Let's, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about bone infection. Um, so you can't tell if you have one by looking at the wound. The, wo the wound can look great and there can still be a bone infection or the wound can look really gross inside and there can be no bone infection. So we use imaging. An MRI is more sensitive than a CT scan. You can still see it on a CT scan. Uh, and that is more sensitive than an X-ray. And an X-ray, you can also see it. It just is harder to appreciate. Um, and so this is an MRI example, and you can see on, uh, it's on your left, but that's actually the patient's right. Uh, and I, can I walk over there? Will you be able to see me if I walk over here? I'm just going to point to it. Uh, this here is the ischium. So these are the, the tops of the femurs. And then these are the, are the ischium, this and this. So you can see this one's white and this one's black, which is pretty obvious. And the white one is infection. That's the inflammation and, and swelling. That's fluid inside the bone that you're seeing. So this is what osteomyelitis looks like on an MRI. All right, so treating bone infections. 
We used to do very long courses, months of antibiotics, um, and we no longer recommend or do that before surgery. Um, there was a question of, should we try and treat the bone infection before we do the surgery? And that turned out not to be a helpful thing. It set people, a lot of people up to have resist, drug resistant bacteria problems. Um, and so we don't do that anymore. Um, it is relatively uncommon for a bone infection to make someone sick, like, septic where they need to go into the hospital as long as it's an open bone infection. So it's draining out of a wound. Um, it's when it's trapped inside the body that it gets more dangerous. Um, and so generally we don't panic if there's a bone infection. We just either, we essentially decide when it's time to do flap surgery based on sort of standard criteria of whether or not your body's making progress. All right. Um, so if the bone needs to be removed, then it's removed at the time of your flap surgery. So there's no sense debriding the bone and exposing the next layer of healthy bone to the outside world. We wanna remove it and cover the healthy bone at the same time. So it's done as one surgery with my orthopedic pelvis colleagues that help me out with these. Um, and then we give antibiotics after the surgery where we've removed the bad bone. We kinda, and then the antibiotics are there to mop up whatever little bits are left behind. All right, let's talk a little bit about flaps. So types of flaps, there are uh, skin and fat flaps. Uh, that's called a fasciocutaneous flap. Uh, and that's essentially leaving the muscle behind. And then there's musculocutaneous, which is the skin, the fat, and the muscle underneath. That's kind of the two basic categories. Um, and in general, when I am using the muscle for a flap, it's rare that I'm using the muscle in a way that would make that muscle, like essentially make the limb non-functional if you, in the future, we develop technology to be able to bring those muscles back to life. So it's usually a segment of a muscle or I'm advancing a muscle and then reattaching it uh, so it would still be functional. So it still has its blood supply and its nerves, like the, everything's still in position. Um, but the important thing is it actually does need a blood supply. So you, there's two words in plastic surgery, big categories, graft and flap. Graft means that the tissue has been removed completely and then put down somewhere else. And a flap means that it has a blood supply and that blood supply remains intact and that tissue can be moved then on the blood supply. And I tell people it's like in your living room, if you have a lamp plugged in, behind your couch and you wanna put the lamp on the other side of the couch, you can only do that if the cord reaches, right? It's the same thing with your with flap tissue. I can only move it as long as the, as far as the blood vessel will reach. So in that sense, you can see these sort of blood vessel leashes. I can dissect all the way down the artery to where it comes off of the branches off the, uh, the bigger tube but I can't make that artery any longer than it is. So I can only move the tissue a certain amount of distance and that limits what can be used to cover any particular wound and how many times I can use that tissue over again because there's only a certain amount of it that can be supplied by that blood vessel. Um, and then the geometry of how a flap works requires very long incisions in order to relax enough tissue so that I don't leave a hole behind somewhere else because it does no good if I move all that tissue and put it over here and now there's a hole over there. So I have to make geometric incisions that borrow from areas of laxity and bring them over to cover up these wounds so that there's no new issue somewhere else. So. I also need to make them big enough that if you get a wound again in the same spot, I can reuse it. So if I have a wound that's this big and I make a flap that's this big to cover it up, then what happens if I get a wound this big in the same spot? Now I only have a little tiny flap next to it and I can't use the tissue behind it. You can't like make a flap outside it, like including another flap. You have to take a whole the other butt cheek then and sacrifice it. And there's only so much butt. So we really have to be very mindful about how many times we're doing flap surgery. If something can be healed without doing a flap surgery, we wanna preserve that tissue because there's a lot of life left to be lived. And we wanna save it for when we absolutely have no other options. All right, 
So I think this is the end. Uh, this is the what you can do. Engage in your care, uh, get your equipment checked, make sure your bowel and bladder management plan is working, that they are not having leakage that's damaging your skin. Eat lots of protein leading up to flap surgery so that you have good reserves. Maintain, particularly for people who do their own transfers and have um, upper extremity function, maintain your upper extremity strength so that you can do safe transfers after surgery. No nicotine. Uh, and then when, if you do have to have flap surgery, you have to do it at a time when you are ready to commit to the full bed rest and recovery protocol. And again, that's the hard part and I can't do it for my patients. So it's a big commitment and it can be frustrating. And I, that's the having buy-in and understanding of what you're signing up for is very important. So surgery is not magic. Uh, there is, you know, we talked about 70% of people taking extra time for about 30 to 40% of that. That's because there's this area that actually splits open that needs either more bed rest or to go back to the operating room and restart our bed rest timer after surgery. There's a portion of people I do, they go through this whole thing, all the surgery, all the recovery, and their wound comes back right away or the surgery doesn't work. Uh, and so uh, that's, this is a, a, an, an unsuccessful rate that's higher than most surgeries that we do. Um, and so I think a lot of surgeons get frustrated with flap surgery and don't wanna do it because we like to win and, uh, and I don't like surgeries that don't work, but this is the only surgery we have for this problem. And I try and do the best one that I can, but they don't all work. And then every time we try and fix it, our chances of it working go down. So prevention is the best medicine. And that is everything. So I'm sure we have some questions. A different timing, is there a different timing for lift transfers? Lift transfers, I guess, as opposed to mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they're, they are the same. So whether or not you are transferring um, on your own or via lift, uh, the timing of the protocol remains the same. Everybody starts their transfers with a lift because you're in an air fluidized mattress and there's nowhere to push off of to get out of it. So you really can't start doing your own transfers if that's how you move. You can't start doing your own transfers until you are in a mattress that you can actually push off of. So everybody starts with a lift, unless you're on the home protocol and you don't have a lift, uh, because at home there is no air fluidized mattress. They don't make them for home. They are not rentable at home. They weigh about four tons. Uh, and I think they cost like $40,000. So. I don't expect or ask patients to have them at home. I think that uh, everybody uses the best mattress that we can have available for them if they're on a home version of this. And then some people don't have lifts and then they go directly to their own transfers. Right, so. Yes, so these are, these are both true. Um, so uh, not every surgeon has the same post-operative protocol. They do have some variability. They all have a bed rest phase and they should all have some sort of gradual remobilization phase. Their timing may look different from mine. Um, not all of them are done inpatient. Um, some hospitals don't, uh, f there's a financial element, I think that some hospitals have a hard time because the insurance companies won't reimburse for the whole six week stay. Um, and so in those cases, patients go to a nursing facility. For us, uh, m my personal team, um, I don't feel like the physical therapists at the nursing facility have the same level of expertise in remobilization. And so when I have the option of using our inpatient rehab unit at the hospital, I like to do that because those are people that I know and, I, and also I can check on the patients myself where if you go to a nursing facility, I can't come see you. Um, so in, I will say that it, the standard varies across the country and across the state and it's not wrong. I think that uh, there are lots of patients that go to nursing facilities and the main thing is to make sure you know what the bed rest timeline is and how to safely remobilize based on your surgeon afterwards. 
And you are absolutely correct that laying in bed for months or weeks makes somebody weak. So if I had a way to do your surgery and get you back up transferring right away, that would be my preference as well. But unfortunately, stitches can't maintain, they can't bear your body weight. And so there, you essentially can't sit on them for a minimum of three weeks because they really have to allow the tissues to heal. The alternative of besides the bed rest after surgery is doing bed rest at home so that your pressure sore can heal through offloading, which also makes people weak. So the real answer is don't get a pressure sore in the first place. Not all of them are preventable. And once you do, there is no real way to heal it without a bed rest period, whether that's after surgery or conservative wound care. So clearly the surgery is a big deal. And somebody got to have a really bad, got, gotten to a bad point in order to need it. Do you have any idea how long people are dealing with this bad pressure sore before it gets to the point yeah. where they're... That's a great question. So I, I usually see people somewhere between four, three to four months is sort of the early side of when people come to me. Um, uh, up to like three years. So that's kind of the range of like, I've been trying to heal this for most people. It's a it, three months is kind of, they're like, it's not making progress. And I want to see what you have to say about it. And then after that, the wait list for surgery has traditionally been quite long at Harborview. And so people then have to wait after I see them for surgery. Um, and that has nothing to do with my desire to do the surgery. It has everything to do with the hospital's capacity. So in general, most people don't get flap surgery sooner than sort of six months from their pressure sore showing up. That is a great question. So the question is, uh, how long should we try and heal something before we consider surgery? Um, and I don't know that there's a hard and fast rule. And, and that what I will say is the time is different from, I start the timer from, when the wound actually starts healing. So there's a period where the injury is actually developing. You know something's gone wrong, and then the injury gets worse for a period because that's actually declaring how bad it was. The injury's already happened, but it, your skin still hasn't shown it yet. And so you'll actually develop necrotic tissue that looks worse and worse, and then it needs to come out, whether that happens through dressing care or a surgical debridement and then it starts to develop healing tissue, that's when the yellow fat that's exposed starts to turn that pinkish strawberry color, that's when I start the timer. So that's the period where your body's actually showing the healing. And I, I'm not aware of research saying that you should wait X number of weeks or X number of months, and if it hasn't healed, that's when you do surgery. I think it's very individualized for patients. My experience, would I would say you want to give it at least three months so that you can see the trajectory. And by that point, around three or four months, you can say, if I just kept graphing this healing, I can see that it's going to heal in, if I give it another couple months, it'll be healed. If your graph essentially goes like this and then just goes flat, like that, it, and you're just like, I'm just not, nothing has changed in the last two, three months, that's when we start thinking about surgery. But you have to actually be doing the wound care and the bed rest in order to know what your trajectory is for healing. So it does, I, I would say three months is probably, but from the time point of when it starts to heal, not from the time point of the injury. Our plastic, right? So the question is, how do we deal with sweat during the hot season and uh, the skin integrity issues with sweat, particularly against a plastic cushion? Um, I think that it depends on your body and everybody's solution is going to be different, but some things that can be tried. Um, there are drying powders that some people use and that uh, I think can be explored, whether or not it's like a talc based, um, that works well for some people to keep skin dry. Um, there's a material called interdry that's actually made for, um, like we call it a panis fold. So when somebody is, uh, has lost a lot of weight or is overweight and has a fold at the belly, they get um, rashes or infections inside the skin folds. And there's a material called interdry 
that is a cloth material that they put in that's made to go in that fold. And so that's another material that could be potentially used to absorb sweat um, and uh, get rid of it that way. Um, there, depending on how, you know, everybody sweats a different amount. There are some even more absorptive materials like called OptiLock, uh, and those ones are very highly absorptive. Uh, there's uh, Botox injections, actually, if you have hyper, like, hydrosis, where you're actually, your, your sweat has become chronically problematic, like, Botox injections for sweat glands can work well. Um, so that's another option. I have not had a patient need that. Um, but I think that if, if that was a particular, like you knew that that was the thing that was putting your skin at risk, that it would be worth that unique solution for it. All right, so the question is, what exercises can we do? Are our isometric exercises safe during the bed rest protocol? And we actually, in the hospital, give people elastic uh, TheraBands um, that are tied to the bed rails um, or uh, overhead to do upper extremity exercises during the bed rest phase. So it is encouraged. Uh, it should be required. Like, it should just be part of your day that you're maintaining your upper extremity strength during that time. You can't do sit-ups uh, because that will put too much pressure. So essentially no truncal exercise, but all the shoulder, shoulder upper extremity that you can do in a side, side or flat lying position is absolutely acceptable. All right, so the question is, uh, what about wound vax? Do they work? Do they not work? Are they good? Are they bad? Um, they are a really, really important medical device. That doesn't mean that they work for every patient or every type of wound. Um, when, I'd say they work more often than not. What they don't work for are infected wounds or wounds that have high exudate. So essentially, and that's usually because it's infected, um, that it has a lot of uh, bacterial drainage because the wound vac, although it can suction up a lot of fluid, it um, can't suction up slime. And so the slime will build up underneath the wound vac and then the wound gets worse because your body can either fight bacteria or build new tissue, but it can't do both. And so if there are too many bacteria in the wound, then it doesn't do any healing. All it can do is try and just stave off the, the bacteria. So you have to have a decontaminated wound for a wound vac to be successful. Um, and then sort of geometry wise, not every wound is the right shape for one. So long tunnels uh, are not good for wound vacs. Uh, narrow necked wounds are not good for wound vacs. You want something that's a, a broader, uh, so, something that is more broad than deep is the right shape. Um, something that's kind of cube shaped would be okay. And then anything that's longer than it is wide is probably not the right shape for a wound vac. So the answer is wound vacs are good, but they are not good for everything. The question is, what do you do? What do patients do if they don't live uh, by a university hospital that has a FLAP program? Um, it's a huge problem, is the answer. I am giving a talk in two weeks that's titled uh, Pressure Store FLAP Programs and What to Do If You Don't Have One. <laughs> um, that is at the literal title of the talk, and it's to the Washington State Plastic Surgery Society. Um, trying to encourage my colleagues to do pressure sore flap surgery, even if they, because what they say is, well, I don't have a rehab doctor here and I don't have a specialty physical therapist to do pressure mapping with me. So I'm going to send them to the university and we don't have the capacity here. So I have regulations from the administration about the criteria. You have to live in King County or have done primary rehab at Harborview or within the UW Medicine. And so if you live in Wenatchee and you don't get, you haven't, didn't get your rehab care here in the UW Medicine system, you don't qualify for pressures or flap care here. And that means that where do you go, right? And I get calls all the time about this and I don't know the answer besides to say, it is incipient on your community to make their plastic surgeons take care of people, um, but I don't, I don't have the answer for it. That's part of the reason I developed the home protocol is for people to be able to still get surgery here with our program and bypass the hospital's regulations about who actually qualifies. Yeah. 
Um, most people have an alternating air pressure mattress that's sort of like the top of the line version of a home mat, like the home hospital bed. Um, and you keep the head of the bed flat, um, including for meals, so the same restrictions. And then you turn positions every two hours. And if you have a sacral flap, then I ask you to try and stay off of your complete supine position. So tilt it up on one hip or the other, or all the way up in sort of fetal position side. So, uh, and I have some, there. it's rare, but I have some patients who prefer to lay prone. And if they can, that's ideal. Um, but it's, we work with what we have. And it has, I have yet to have a failure of the home, pro, home program, even without an air fluidized mattress. But I'm pretty selective about who I offer it to because they have to have enough caregivers at home to make it feasible. So they're usually quite engaged in their own care. They have help at home or a caregiver or caregiver hours that are maximally supportive. So it takes the right candidate for it to be successful. Yeah, we, um, we used to have a phase called the flap lying phase, which was sort of between uh, the air fluidized mattress and the seating mobilization. And it's where I just made people, it wasn't me, it sort of came, I inherited the flap lying phase where you just lay on a regular mattress on your flap. And that was sort of thought to be like halfway between uh, the like air fluidized and the seating. Um, but I don't think that it had any benefit. And what I think happens is that as you start sitting more, that pressure is the sort of, that's maximum, right? This, that seating pressure. And so once you're up to four hours of tolerating your chair, then the bed that you're using at home, the mattress is kind of night, it's like less pressure than the chair is. So the, the chair kind of thing stands in for all the scenarios that home is gonna encompass. Um, but I, I, I think we have talked about it over time. I'm not sure that it would uh, significantly change things for us. I think I see another question on here. Can I just read it? Yeah, go ahead. All right, the question says, for a small wound over a year old is a soft callus an okay signed versus a hard callus? On the coccyx area, that is, this is not a rough callus, but soft and rolls off every few weeks. Um, yes, um, the, the answer is that if, you, if your skin is stable and in the integrity is preventing bacteria from getting into the bone and there's not fluid leaking out of uh, broken skin that's causing maceration, friction damage, shear, then that's fine. Whatever your skin is doing is fine, whether it's you know dry and flaky or you have a, a calloused area or a chronic scab or an unstable, like a kind of unstable keratinized area. That tends to happen if you've had a chronic wound that, or you had a very large wound that healed, it's like a marathon and when it gets to the end, it gets kind of tired. Uh, as long as it's not weeping fluid that's damaging the surrounding skin or letting bacteria in, it's probably fine. Okay, it's been a pleasure.